So we've been talking about logic and reasoning and real math and trues and falses and all kinds of cool stuff in this lesson. This is unit two, lesson seven. We are going to be dipping our big toe way into actually doing proofs. So we're going to be doing our first major two column <coughs> proof for this class, which is the only way I teach to do proofs. Uh, this textbook that uh, we're using in my classes as of now, they teach paragraph proofs and flowchart proofs as well. And I've seen various things in, in other classes. Um, I don't like paragraph proofs and I never had to write one. Most people are never gonna have to write one. Two column proofs at this level are probably the most straightforward way to go about getting a proof down on paper. Um, and if you end up getting it into a degree program where you're in a class where you're going to have to write paragraph proofs and other styles of formal proof, then you should be taught how to do it, how that particular professor wants it then. So for now, for us, we're just going to do two column proofs. But before we dive into our example of a two column proof, we are going to look at a couple of new postulates. Remember postulates are the, the no-duh math statements, the ones that don't actually need any proving, they just are true. So the first one is the ruler postulate. It's one of the most no-duh of the no-duh things. The ruler postulate says the points on any line or line segment can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with real numbers. Now, that sounds a titch confusing, um, but all that really basically means, and you can get this from, you can probably figure it out from the title, is that we can draw a line. If we have a line or a line segment, then we can put lines on it that represent numbers, that represent real numbers. That's really all this postulate says. It's super easy peasy, no big deal. <clears throat> the next one we've actually already used technically before. I've even mentioned it before in other lessons. This time we're going to formally get it down on paper. So the segment addition postulate says if A and B and A, B, and C are collinear, so on the same line, then point B is between A and C if and only if the measure of A, B plus the measure of C, B, C equals the measure of A, C. Remember that numbers are equal, pictures are congruent, right? As we're going to see that in this, in this proof example that we look at here in a bit. So basically that's saying that that B is in between these two, right? If you can add these two up and get the total one, then those that's the only way B would actually be between those two things. So that's so basically in practice what that means as far as usefulness, we've seen before that if we have B in between A and C, then to get A and C total, we can add them up and you get that total measure. Let's clear these guys off our screen and then we'll look at our first proof example. <clears throat> so we've got a figure here. Um, it, one of the first things you'll want to do if you don't aren't given a figure in the proof uh, is draw the picture. But we're given the picture here, which is very helpful. So what we want to do is we want to prove that segment CE is congruent to segment FE and segment ED is congruent to segment EG. Then segment CD is congruent to FG. So what we want to do first is we want to set up our two columns. Okay, so we're going to set up our two columns here. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to do this first one in handwritten. Um, we may, we'll, we'll see how this goes. As we continue doing these, I may have to do some method where I type or some combination, or I may have to pre-do it and then reveal them one at a time, which I don't love that idea. It's less dynamic, and but we'll see. So on the left-hand side, we have our statements. I know this is probably the first proof most of you who are watching this video have ever done. And so we're gonna walk it through all the pieces. And then on the right-hand side, we have the justification or the reason, depending on they, they being both the same thing. I like the word justification better because it sounds cooler. 
but reason is also oops e i o n uh but reason is also perfectly accessible actually after we do a few of these i probably will just write s and j but <coughs> in the <coughs> excuse me first time or two we're, we'll write it fully out so we know what we're talking about. So in the statements and the justification. Now, we're going to also write over here what we are trying to prove. Now, what we're trying to prove is that segment CD is congruent to segment FG. Okay, so we're going to write that over here. So this is, this is where we are going in our proof. This is our goal. To get down, we need this at the very end of the proof to say this statement and how we got there. Well, we're going to walk all through all the pieces of the puzzle, right? Root F, G. Okay. So, I'm going to label label what we're trying to prove in red. This is going to be our proof color, or what we're trying to prove. So, we're trying to prove that CD, so this big segment here, this, this big one, this big guy is congruent to FG. So we're trying to prove that these two pieces are congruent. So now we're going to label our given. I'm going to label our given in green. It seems reasonable. So our given, this is all your first step of your proof is pretty much always the given. Okay. Your, or your statement number one. And your justification, your statement number one is what's given. Now, what's given is that CE is congruent to FE. So, CE is congruent to segment FE. Now, I'm going to also label this on my picture as well. So, CE, so this one, is congruent to that one. We better do two tick marks since I used one tick mark to mark what we're trying to prove. Okay, so we're given that. We are also given that ED, segment ED, is congruent to segment EG. Right? And our justification for this first one, I already said, and it's still true, is given. So that's the so the justification is the reason why we can say whatever we put over there. So that's going to be pretty much always our first step. Now I'm going to go also go ahead and label this. It's useful to label what you know and as we prove more things to label those things and all of that it's going to help us kind of see where we need to go. So ED is congruent to EG. So that's this one right there. So now our given is labeled and it's written down. So we we know just a handful of postulates, right? We know segment addition and that's pretty nearly it. We know some we know how to use substitution, we know some basic arithmetic, all those all those things. So we need to prove that this whole thing is congruent to that whole thing. Now, the first thing we need to do is, you know, the, our, our segment addition postulate, the way it's written is it's written the measure of this plus the measure of that equals the measure of that. So our very first thing that we want to do <coughs> is we want to essentially rewrite this statement, but with measures and equals instead of, instead of congruence. So let's do that. Let's pick another color. Yellow, I think, would be pretty clear. So our statement two is going to be the measure of segment CE equals the measure of segment FE and the measure of segment ED equals the measure of segment EG. Now, what justification can we give for that? So, what is congruence? Congruence is equal, but for pictures. And so, what we're doing in order to let us rewrite this this way is we're using simply the definition of congruence. The definition of congruence. Congruence lets us turn congruent 
and equals. Okay, that's all we're using for that. So now that we have that piece of the puzzle, we can do a few other things. So we can say because of the segment addition postulate, we can say a couple of different things. So I'm going to put my justification first. So the segment addition postulate. Oh, that's a Q. What am I doing? Segment addition. Okay. We're going to say a couple of different things. I'm going to put them on a cup. I'm going to put two things on one line. The, for me personally, now this, this, your, your results are going to vary. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, your mileage may vary uh, as far as your teacher or professor or whoever is doing this. But when I, for me and in my class, when we're doing proofs, if you can say use the same justification for two things and it's on the, it, it, the one doesn't, we don't need the one to prove the other, then you can write them on the same step. So I'm going to say for in this case that the measure of CD equals the measure, <coughs> excuse me, of CE. So CD equals measure of CE plus the measure of ED. And we can say that because segment addition lets us say that, right? We can also say by segment addition that the measure of F G equals the measure of F E plus the measure of E G. And if you're if you're finding yourself wondering at this moment, how in the world are we knowing to do these things? Well, two ways that we know what to do at this point. One is we're in a high school geometry class. So it's probably going to relate. We're probably at some point going to use some of the most recently you learned postulates or theorems or whatever. We haven't learned any theorems yet, but when we do the most recent postulates or theorems, you're probably going to use some of those. You, you, that kind of mind can give you a clue ooh, that you're going to want to head towards that space. The other thing is, and this, you know, and as if we do more complicated things, sometimes you kind of just start writing stuff that's true that you can say like we're going to learn stuff about vertical angles i guess we've already kind of learned vertical angles and linear pairs and all that kind of stuff uh but you know you if you start seeing some of that you can say okay well these are vertical angles and so they're congruent and this is that and that's you can just start saying stuff and then as you start saying stuff the pieces start to fit together Okay, so those those are the two kind of methods to if you're lost is first think about what postulates and theorems we learned recently, and second, sometimes you just got to start saying stuff that you see by justifications that you know, and then as you start adding stuff, you start stuff starts to fit together. So let's continue this proof. So what we can do now is. Step four, because CE, the measure of CE equals the measure of FE, we can say, and because that we can, we can, we can take, I'm going to get words out of my mouth. What do y'all think? I can say that the measure of CE plus the measure of ED equals the me measure of, hold on. I'm trying to I, uh, time out. Pause. Sorry, I started trying, you know, because I was walking through this the way I was writing, and then I started looking at the book example to sanity check, and then because they did things in a little bit different order than what I was doing, I confused myself, and so I didn't want to confuse you. So I had to pause to unconfuse my brain that since I was trying to do too many things at once so that I won't confuse you. So up here, we've got that CE is... Uh, the measure of CE equals the measure of FE, right? And so we could take and substitute FE, the measure of FE for the measure of CE, 
because that's how substitution works. Substitution property, right? Which so that should give you a clue on the justification we're about to use. Now we could also say that the measure of since the measure of ED equals the measure of EG, we could substitute the measure of EG in for right there. So basically, we're going to kind of rewrite this first line here using substitution. Let me show you what we're talking about. So we're going to we're going to leave the measure of CD right there and that equals now instead of the measure of ce we're going to put the measure of fe because they are equal we can substitute them right so the measure of fe and then plus and we're going to do the same thing with this piece with this piece we're going to substitute eg in for ed so the measure of e g and we use the substitution property, which we learned probably in Algebra 1, actually. Substitution property. Okay. So, now we've got CD, measure of CD, equals measure of FE plus the measure of EG. And we've got the measure of FG equals the measure of FE plus the measure of EG. So, these two are equal... So now we can say on our fifth step, we're almost at the finish line, that the measure of segment CD equals the measure of segment FG because, drum roll, substitution property, because if they're equal and we substitute it because they're equal, then we're using the substitution property. And then last step, because we're almost there. This doesn't quite look like that yet. But our sixth and final step on this proof, <coughs> excuse me, is saying CD is congruent to FG because definition of congruence. That, that, that's saying that equal and congruence are the same. Numbers are equal. Pictures are congruent, right? Definition of congruence. That's it. There's your first, first proof. Now, I like to... I, expect, I, I probably won't ever mention this again, but I like to add, now this is usually more in paragraph proofs, I like to say that, that in a formal paragraph proof, you add QED because it's fun. Now, what does QED stand for? QED is Latin for quote eris demonstratum, and what it means is, and thus it is proved. And so, and thus, you have taken and dipped your big toe in, into proving things and proofs. We're going to do lots and lots more. It's going to be a ton of fun. I love solving puzzles. That's what proofs are, are solving puzzles a piece at a time. It's lots of fun. Hope you enjoyed it. If you're one of my students, I will see you in class. Do your homework, all the things. Whether you're one of my students or not, thank you for joining us. Let us know in the comments how we can help you with your math, your science, or your general homeschool journey. Don't forget to hit subscribe and like this video. Thanks and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.